Bingo, we're back on Given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Community Matters. And Peter Adler joins us today. He was the convener at the Morning Media Symposium last Thursday. Welcome, welcome, Peter. You did a great job last week. We Always really good appreciate fun. that. All yeah, good fun. Yeah. Always fun to be with you. Let's review and have a retrospective. Um, you know, who was there, for example? Well, we, I, I think uh, we want to highlight some of the media people. There was uh, Hawaii Public Radio was there. Civil Beat was there. KHON was there. We had independent, uh, you know, uh, bloggers like Ian Lind. Uh, it was a real interesting dialogue. And Steve Petranik, obviously from Hawaii Business, who was one of our uh, panel leaders. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. It was really replete with, uh, yeah, with media from around good town. And it's interesting the juxtaposition because it's local media, but you know, we live in a world of a firestorm of media, of national media, with um, your friend Donald Trump. I say he's your friend because I know he's not my friend. Uh, and so the question really is, is, how do you relate those two things? How can, as convener, how can you have a conversation about local media and not really deal with the national, the troubles, the challenges, uh, oh gosh, the, you know, the, the, the malevolent things that happen vis-a-vis -vis the national media? Well, you, you know, you, the point is that the world is on fire right now. And I would like to argue that Hawaii is smoldering. We are on fire too, it's a slower burn. Mm. But we're not quite as outrageous and crazy as what we see every day on the national news. Uh, I mean, our president is just kind of loose. And he's running loose and he's running scared and he's just, I, you know, maybe unstable. Yes. So, and then we have, you know, lots of foreign actions and we have domestic actions and the impeachment. So there's that whole world of stuff. And you could, some would say it's always on fire, It's always on fire. But today it's acute. We have an acute burn going on. Yeah. But we also have our local smoldering problems here that I think are coming up. The flames are rising. Yeah. So you mentioned you had some insights as a result of part of the conversation last Thursday. Can you give us some of those insights? Insights, uh, you're doing me honor with that word, insights. <laughs> I took a lot of notes, even though I opened and closed the, the session. It was really led by yourself and Steve Petranik, who led very good panels. But uh, there were things I heard that rang my bell. And I'll just run through a couple of them, and we and there's more later on. Um, we talked a lot about um, kind of the essence of good journalism, which is voice, solutions, truth, and above all, stories. Good stories that people that compel people, either longer, if you prefer longer, shorter, whatever form you prefer it in. And uh, Brett Opergard said, for example, uh, the value of great stories in the public space is that they get people talking, they get people buzzing around a bit. And uh, they identify problems, they work solutions, they work different voices. So I, 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 it was a good reminder just to start out with to say, stories, we're, we're all about stories. And then you get into the question of true stories and false stories and fake news and real news. But you know, it's a good reminder that that's mm -hmm. what journalists do, is they, they dig for stories or mm -hmm. they tell a story mm -hmm. and uh, they hope to create a buzz. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called stories. That's, that's <laughs> what it is. And we know actually that humans we communicate best through stories. Facts, eh, so so, it's okay in some. But we know that's where we started around campfires with stories. Yeah. What'd you do today, Jay? And what'd you do, yeah. um, you know, yeah. Olaf? And what did you do today, Og? <laughs> and we, oh, I saw this really interesting thing across the river. I found a big bear or whatever it was. That's our roots. And we're still part of it. Sort of I was giving my theory before uh, the show began about, uh, you know, the, the species. The species is a social animal. We're a social animal. And that means we talk to each other. We, we either collaborate uh, in order to bring the big bear down, <laughs> or right. we don't in order to have a big fight, right. or war, or what have you. Um, but we deal together. Uh, at the end of the day, you can't be alone in the North Woods. That doesn't work. That's clear. Hard. That's no it's longer hard. a viable option for anybody. <laughs> That's right. so, so the question is, um, you know, what, a f so the quality of this conversation the quality of this communication of social animals socializing with each other around the campfire or otherwise, what effect does that have on our, what do you call a political structure, on our structure as a large conglomeration of people in this country, 350 million, whatever it is, um, and in other places, and on the world stage as well. Um, if, if it's good, what happens? If it's bad, what happens? What does it mean to our form of government, our democracy? What does it mean to our quality of life? Got an answer on that? Well, I don't think I have an answer, but I think I uh, would share a few thoughts, certainly. I've never been shy about doing that with you, Jay. So I think just as the world is going through massive disruptions and changes in the order of things, um, 
So is journalism. Journalism is fragmented. I was saying before we started, you know, they used to call it the fourth estate. Now it's a bunch of little bungalows and condos <laughs> and hovels over here and gated communities over there. It's, it's not an estate. It is no longer a, an estate in the traditional way that it might have been in the 1950s. So we got a very disrupted world of journalism. And the question, one of the questions that came out was, what's the key to sustainability? How, who's going to survive? Will think tech survive? Will, you know, KHON TV do it? And there were a few clues in there. There were a few clues that I heard. And again, I'm a writer, but I'm not necessarily a journalist. Um, and one of the clues was from Bill Dorman. He said, really zeroing in on your audience and doing the analytics and figuring out who are you telling those stories to? Who do you want to have listen or hear? Um, th that was a, I, I was a very important moment for me because Dorman was reminding us that, you know, in this sprawl of new journalism, you got to figure out who you want to talk to or who you want to have read or mm. who you want to have write. Mm. And you've got to get some analytics around that. Mm. Digression for a moment. Absolutely. Brad Pasquale, Pasquale. Remember the name? We'll hear more about him. He was the um, he was the tech um, the tech political guy for um, Trump in the 2016 election. He is now the overall uh, campaign manager. He's probably 30, maybe less. He's brilliant, American from an American school. I want to say in the South or the Midwest. Um, you know, this is not Harvard and Yale, um, and he is a genius. This guy understands about you know connecting with your audience. He understands about dealing with, um, you know, uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, which is what he did uh, back in 2016. He understands about examining the audience and, you know, messaging to the audience. At a micro audience. level, too. Micro level. And it's more of an art form now than it was in 2016. Uh, there was an article in the Times a couple of days ago about, about how uh, Trump was way ahead of the Democrats in terms of understanding how you reach subsets, what did data I hear, subsets. Did I hear 20, Trump has issued 45 million tweets or something like that since he took office, and he's hitting huge numbers of people. I mean, huge numbers he's of spending people. Spending enormous amounts yeah, of money. And he's got lots of money, and he's raising more money. That's what he does. Yeah. And, and he figures that you know, the, the way it works now is social media. Right. The way you win votes in elections, social media. And the article stood for the proposition that he will win. Uh, because he understands social media. So in a sense, our conventional, our conventional media program last Thursday, you know, was conventional. We don't Old understand school. Brad Pasquale no. or, or the leverage that he has and will continue to have and, and improve on. It. But, but Opergar, Brett from the university, said something key at the beginning. He said, and you were moderating that panel, he said, technology is the driver. And that's a great example. Pasquale's a great example of it. So he's figured out a technology and an analytic process of using that technology, and that is building the strategy that they have for moving their stories around. True or false stories, it doesn't matter. They, the technology is the driver. That was Brett's point. Yeah, it's almost as if the true of, <laughs> you heard it here, it's almost as if the true of falsity doesn't really matter. It, it's, it's how people react to that. Whether you're reaching, uh, you know, Bill Dorman's uh, audience subset and having effect on their opinion and therefore on public opinion in general. One of the things I liked about our session was Steve Petranik brought from Hawaii Business. He brought in some data. He brought some data to the table. So we were all conjecturing on opinions and ideas and blah 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 blah. And he said, you know, his numbers and I don't remember. I don't have the numbers, but he said they know that video reaches the most people now but it's also more expensive uh, and it produces fewer stories compared to written products uh, that produce, they're cheaper in some ways, and uh, produce more stories. And the younger people are reading. That's a, so more a than demographic. The older, yeah. older people are watching yeah. True, they're sitting at, you know, uh, in a couch that's right. somewhere. Uh, the younger people are reading, and why, I mean, that's, it's not yet completely known, but why, one reason is that you can read faster. Uh, you don't have to wait for the agenda of the television show. You can read right now. You can see the point. You can get it from the headline, the first paragraph, go to the next one. And you have a lot of stuff being thrown at you. You can, you know, absorb more. Absorb may not be the right word. You can have some contact with more news, be aware of more stories, and therefore enjoy your conversation with your peers, right, who, who love yeah. to hear that you are well-informed, or not because you know the, the in-depth story, but because you know the headlines. Yeah. 
One of, one of the interesting side impacts of that, I, I hang out with uh, people who are writers. They write books, and like me, it's a writing is a hobby. It's not like I'm making my living doing it, although I did a little freelance work earlier. Um, but one of, one, of the, one of the things is that the, there's less and less of a tendency to read longer form writing, right? So you can write a brilliant essay and it's 30 pages. Who's going to read it? Nobody. They'll read the executive summary. They'll read the, the you know, first couple of paragraphs. You better summarize things. And those few who want to dig deeper can read the rest. But there's a, there's a shrinking of attention that's going on. And the other thing that's happening is we now live in an attention society where big money is betting that they can capture your attention for eight to ten seconds on they something. They are. Yeah. You know, I mean, depend, yeah, it I works. I think you make a real study of that. Young people, old people, you know, um, uh, all kinds of different subsets, and they have different attention spans. I know watching this show, you know, our average is like nine minutes. After that, they're off. And I think actually, uh, Peter, we're, we're beyond the nine minutes. We're, except um, they probably left already. Passe. Let's take a break. <laughs> Peter Adler, Accord 3.0. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life, and the lives of people around you. Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel? Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Yeah, good. Okay, we're back, Peter and me. Uh, so we're going to talk about sacred cows because uh, Ian Lind was, was really spellbinding. He, he talked about sacred cows. What does that mean? In, in the local press, you know, and I suppose in, in all of the press nationally, there are some topics people don't want to write about or talk about or cover. And we go like that. Yeah, you we go, go like that. Yeah, go like that. Uh, so anyway, uh, can you remember some of the yes, sacred I do. cows? And, and, and Ian's point was in the context of investigative journalism because that's what he's done, you know. Uh, for much of his career, his multiple careers. He's been an investigative journalist, and he still does that. He likes to dig on a story, go down to the bureau conveyances, gather everything up, and figure out uh, what's going on with this action. So uh, one of the things he said was, and I think it was in response to the demise of in investigative journalism in the mainstream media, that there's very little of it. And the reason for it is people can't afford it. You know, KHON can probably afford a little bit, uh, and they'll send off one of their reporters, Mahalani or somebody else, to go dig a story. But for the most part, you know, the Star Advertiser and other papers like that. They read it off a prompter. Yeah, or they're taking people's press releases, and then every once in a while somebody will follow a trail. Yeah. But he talked about, he said, if you really want to do investigative work, whether it's in the new media or in the old media, what you really need to do is figure out the sacred cows. What, what is it that nobody is talking about or people are a little afraid to talk about. And he cited some very specific examples. Uh, he said, for example, in Hawaii, how come nobody's really dug down into the finances of the Hawaiian organizations? Now, sensitive, difficult. Nobody wants to attack Hawaiians and be thought of as anti-Hawaiian. But he said, lots of money in the Ali'i trusts, lots of money at OHA, civic clubs. Uh, the, you know, there's just the organizations that have wealth. They, they have, they're sitting on resources. And that becomes especially important if we want to talk about the dominion and domain of a future sovereign region. Where's the dough going to come from? So he said, that's an example of a sacred cow that people go, eh, a little sensitive. We don't want to offend anybody. We live in an island where... Go make A. Yeah, exactly. You know, go along, get along, all that stuff. He said a second one was the real estate world, which hasn't really been, you know, explored and possibly exposed. And there's interesting changes going on in the real estate world, but it's a big operation here in Hawaii. So, you know, it's a big sector. 
He said, you know, that's worth exploring and digging around on if somebody had, was enterprising. He talked about organized labor. Now, there's an interesting one, right? Because we know uh, Hawaii is very labor, pro-labor, or very labor-oriented. Our, our legislators are, tend to be you know, approved of by labor or disapproved of by labor, either in their elections or during their sessions. He said, we have, how come we've not read any good stories? How come we haven't, nobody's followed the trail of the influence of organized labor? And that's just, that doesn't say it's all bad. It just yeah. says, where's the, there's a story. How come we're not looking at it? Yeah. And then the last one he mentioned was airports. He said, there's a, our airport is kind of junkalunka, right? And, you know, it's compared Worse all the time, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, it looks pretty bad. So he says, how come nobody's really dug on that story? So he was saying, these are sacred cows, that, and there are others that you could probably get. That's the key to investigation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, uh, and that was so provocative when he was, was talking. He was really one of the best speakers in the crowd. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and so what, what's, what I get is, and somebody else talked about this, well, you know, local. It's not that much local news, and therefore, you know, the star advertiser is kind of thin, and, you know, you, you only hear about accidents and weather and sports. and Obituaries. And, <laughs> on, on TV. And, but, you know, that's, that, to say that there's no news here is ridiculous. This is, a, this is a place loaded with stories. I remember when The Descendants came out, the movie, and uh, George uh, Clooney uh, you know, played the movie. And everybody said, gee, that's our story. We know that <laughs> story. Right. How come Hollywood is coming and taking our story? Fact is, there's a thousand, thousand stories like The Descendants, which we have not exploited, we have not revealed. And there's a thousand, thousand stories we could include in our media, which we don't, sacred cows or otherwise. And that, that may be one of the future strands, you know, in this diminished fourth estate, but the rise of all the bungalows and condos and <laughs> little hovels and hostels and whatever. One of those niches, I think, if I'm gleaning this right from all the conversation, Maybe very localized news, very localized news. People want to know what's going on in their neighborhood. They want to know about that burglary that took place or that peeping Tom who's crawling around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They want to know about the speed bumps and the potholes. And the, you know, it may be that people, there's a real market. And that's again where Dorman's comment about the analytics of who's your audience, I think becomes important to the future of uh, viability of different well, kinds of journalism. There's something called Next Door, I think it's called Next Door. And, and, and about a month ago, they wanted me to sign up, so I signed up on the net, yeah. And now I get, uh, I get mail, I don't know how many times a day, about every little thing about lost dogs. and uh, In your own hood. In, in my own hood, my next block. And it's very local. It's very newsy. It's very helpful. And who's it's producing to be that? Helpful. Who produces that? Where does it's that a come? national. It's a national that comes local. Huh. And it's very interesting how this works, because it's what you're talking about. It's news, but it's local news. And it's refined down to my neighborhood. Yeah. It's not the next neighborhood. It's only my neighborhood. So you say, well, maybe this is the future. Maybe it's the future of those bungalows and cottages. Uh, and maybe those bungalows and cottages are not old, old time newsmen who have been around since Jimmy Cagney. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're dating yourself Clark, and me, Clark but Clark Kent and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the new the new people who are going to do next door and do that refined thing that Bill Dorman talked about. They're younger, and they uh, are interested in the stories. Right. Uh, the problem that I have, though, and uh, I'd like your thought about this, is the problem is that at the end of the day, we have to educate people who stopped their education at college or high school, most people, uh, and they said, I don't like school anymore, and I'm going to sort of learn as I go, and, uh, and I'll talk to my friends if they do, and, and I'll learn that way. And then they wind up learning at 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock. That's when they learn. Uh, for eight minutes or something on, on television. Not enough. You can't be a worthy, responsible, accountable citizen doing that. You have got to be educated to cast a ballot. So my training's in sociology. So my instinct is to say to that person who's only watching at six or nine or 10 or whatever it is, is not to say you gotta learn about everything else, it's to say what do you wanna learn about? What's the curiosity, what, what is it that interests you? Is it you know, our local politics at the state level. Is it your island? Is it your neighborhood? Is it the national scene? I want to know what they want. Well, I want to know funny. what they're I, thinking about. I, you know, I had a conversation with uh, the, what do you call it, the, the, the advisory council at KGMP, uh, Hawaii News Now in time. They said, uh, and I said, well, why don't you show people what they need to know? It's different. Need to know. Uh, they need to know about what's happening in the legislature, city council, government in general, the, you know, the, the fiscal policy, all that. 
And, um, and Rick Blangiardi said, no, 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 we, we know what they want. Accidents, uh, crime, weather, weather and sports. We yeah. know, and we, <laughs> that's what we give them. And, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fluff stories about uh, the kids on the weekends having a, have an event or something. Um, and you know, my problem with that is that that does not make responsible citizens and serious players in a democratic society. Um, and I do, and I so I take your point and I change it to say we have to tell them what they need to know. They may not be able to determine what they need to know. They have responsibilities, and uh, the responsibilities don't stop at, at fluff stories. No, I agree. I mean, I agree. There's a, a certain amount, but I'm. I think this is such a time of ferment. It would be interesting to understand what people want. What do they want? What do they want from think tech, from our shows? What do they want from uh, you know uh, Star Advertiser? What do they want from Civil Beat? And you know the feedback channels uh, need to be open within the range of what people can do. I mean, the media can't do everything. You can do some things, yeah. but I think we you know need a little more feedback, genuine good feedback about. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, but I, I'm not disagreeing. We you know we need to find ways. I mean, I've always I've always thought we should give uh, the DOE should require citizenship tests for high school graduation. <laughs> What's the same citizenship <laughs> test that what we ask? Great idea. Yeah, yeah. We're, how, they got to take it. How come you <laughs> yeah, know really? like, this kid doesn't have to take it? How come my kids didn't have to take <laughs> if it? If you want to vote, at least know something. Damn right. There's three branches of government. Here's the president. He's got two terms. There's you know I mean there's some fundamentals. And of course, we know people have lost that. They don't know that. There's that much civics going on. <laughs> Let's go to the last and most important point of our discussion. How is the press, you know, which is under such stress, economic stress, uh, political stress from guys like Trump, um, you know, the stress of people not wanting, not caring, not reading, not consuming news. Yeah. Those are all big stresses on, on a media that has, you know, developed under the First Amendment since, uh, since the Constitution. And now it's under attack in so many ways. How can it be sustainable? And the primary issue there is, you know, is economic. How does it stay in business? How does it keep doing what it thinks yeah. it should do? And one, one of the things we didn't get to, because we only had a couple hours to do this with, with uh, what was it, 40 people in the room or so. One of the things we didn't talk about was the antidote to the fake news battles. And we didn't get a chance to talk about it, and I think it's actually worthy of a, another conversation. Yes. Just on that. Yes. And there, there may be some antidotes to that, some things that can be done either regulatorily or uh, voluntarily by through the pledges of companies and media outlets. So it's a big one, because right now one of the, the, the tendencies is to say, I'm not going to listen to any of this bullshit. None of it. I don't Can trust I say bullshit? Can I say that? I talk to here Trump in this neighborhood. I don't trust the press at Exactly. All. I don't trust any media. I don't know what to trust and who to trust. Yeah. So until people, there's people who are looking for some kind of a compass or, you know, a navigational tool that can help them with that. And I don't think it's fully evolved at all, but that's worthy of another mm -hmm. big conversation. Well, you know, they say a couple of people with smart ideas can change the world, and maybe, you know, that'll happen. Maybe somebody will have a smart idea. It will be high tech, uh, like Blanchiardi is also talking about technology as the future of news, and I certainly agree. Um, and it can be this kind of technology that Zuckerberg does, which I, in, is often destructive. Um, and it, or it can be the kind of technology you're talking about, which right. is productive and constructive. So the question I put to you, though, is economically, how can they make a living? You can't sell newspapers on the street corner anymore. Uh, it's hard to get people to subscribe for $10 a month. It's hard to do that. It's, it's being done by the newspapers, some of them anyway. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to be in print. It's just hard to be in print. It's too expensive to print it and distribute it and all that. It's hard to have investigative reporters. Uh, how are we going to thread, thread the needle on this? And there were a few comments towards that about sustainability of me different media. And they talked about the Civil Beat model, which is a nonprofit. Please give us donation. They also have you know, a patron. They have a big daddy in Pierre Omidyar, but he doesn't pay for everything, and they are building, and so they have a nonprofit model. Please give us five bucks or a dollar a day or whatever their pitch is. We talked about uh, the, the midweeks and the star advertisers and how they have to re really rely on ads and advertising. So, uh, you know, I think there's a time for a reinvention, and this, it is a tough question because uh, unless you know who your audience is, as Dorman said, and unless you know you have some analytics on that stuff, how do you find the support channel? And we got, we got to do it. We got to do it here at ThinkTech. We got to do it everywhere. Yeah. Anybody wants to survive. 
Yeah, and we are a nation. We have to have, we have to clean this up. This right now, it's not working. It's like it's like in the movie The Terminator when he comes up and he says, "You want to live? Come with me." <laughs> <laughs> so how are they going to live? Pretty how are they? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we so, don't know. No, we don't know. And um, you know, it concerns me what you were talking about before. I'd like to latch on that for a minute. Um, you know, if you have a problem of this magnitude, a problem with the media of this magnitude. Uh, one possibility is to get the government to regulate how it's doing. And, and that is a very, um, you know, uh, suggestive, uh, if not seductive, uh, possibility in, in Congress. They're having hearings already, and they want to talk to, they want to reform Facebook and this and that. And uh, largely on questions of news and news And delivery. monopoly questions. Yeah, yeah, I think there's monopoly, monopoly, monopoly questions. Monopoly around news, right? The consolidation of right. hundreds of radio stations, and they all happen to be just right of center, or very right of center. So it's a problem when you say, well, the only people who can solve this problem is the government. I don't think the founding fathers was, were thinking of that. They, they, they did not want the government involved in the press. One of the themes I heard from our, our friends and colleagues in that session uh, was people are going to have to get used to the idea of paying for news and paying for stories. The notion that it's all freebies, that's coming to an end one way or another. People have to pay. You have to subscribe. You have to donate. You have to do this. You have to do that. Uh, otherwise, those channels go away. And I heard that pretty strongly from several people. I also heard Mahalani Richardson talk about the evolution of press that has multiple platforms. They are on the net. They are you know, on TV. They are on the radio. They are on podcasts. There's multiple things. Uh, and you know, the, I think the bigger ones are going to do that. Sure, and if you have multiple things going on, you can pick and choose which one is making more money for you, which, is, which has the greatest leverage, the, re the greatest reach, and go that way, like a pseudopod in an amoeba, right? You find, you find your path and you drop off the ones that don't work. And I think it's very important, and I, and I point to two yeah. possibilities for your consideration, Peter, which we did not get to do, discuss on the last Thursday. One is books. You know, um, so I watch Rachel Maddow. I like Rachel Maddow. She's written two books in the last six months or less. Good books, and it's about things that are happening right yeah, now, yeah. things that are relevant to understanding the world around us. And then you start looking at all those guys from the New York Times and Washington Post. They're all writing books. Go to Kindle. You can download them in a one-minute flat. And this is news. The question is who's reading them? How, how much reading goes on? Too? Good question. That's my question, because... Uh, if you're writing longer form uh, writing, you know, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, the question is, are there readers? Yeah. Are there readers? And I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's enough that Rachel Maddow has a good name or Susan Rice or others, and people will just buy it for the name. And I don't know. It's, it's a really good question. Yeah. And who knows? maybe they should be short books. <laughs> that could be the answer. You know, we'd like to get them right here on this show. You know, Susan Rice, for example, Rachel, Rachel Maddow. One other thing that pops up along the same lines is Frontline. I think Frontline is yeah. an example of what you can do in a fairly compressed period of time with a news story that requires some drill down. And they have done a number. And they've sustained. Sustainable. As and has Meet the Press, the one of the oldest shows on the networks. Yeah. Somehow they've managed to figure out a survival strategy. And I don't know what the key is. Well, I don't, who knows what the secret sauce is? No, but we have to, we have to keep watching. We've got to find it. And we have to keep following it, and yeah. you have to keep on organizing these programs. <laughs> so, you were the real organizer. I was popped up for ceremonial purposes. That was great. That was great. <laughs> so, Peter, what's your closing remark? I mean, there's camera one over there. They want to know what you want to leave with them. This is your big opportunity, and you may select a one-word description of what you have in mind. You like that. Stories. Go for stories. I think stories are the essence. Uh, stories... Make the world, and the world is made of stories. It's not made of molecules. It's not made of laws and regulations. It's made of stories. And let's focus on the stories, pay attention to the stories, listen to stories, read stories, and write stories. And there are so, so many stories. There are. <laughs> then let's get the good ones. It's great to be alive these yeah. days, yeah. I think. I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Adler. Thank you, Dave. Great to always talk to you. Always a pleasure. As always. As yeah. always. Good oh. fun. <laughs>